Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the Haydn Symphony Crusade. And now we're up to Symphony Number no. 41. And this is really exciting because now we're into Haydn's Sturm und Drang period, storm and stress. And it's worth making a few general points about the storm and stress period before we continue, just so we can get our bearings. I want you to hear the first subject of the first movement. Quite a remarkable little bit of music. Here it is, listen to this. that's just the first theme of the first movement, or the first subject. That has several remarkable features, which we're going to talk about in a second. But the point I want to make is that is as Sturm und Drangy as any of the hysterical works in minor keys for which the Sturm und Drang period is famous. Because it really is a misnomer or a mistake to think of you know, the Sturm und Drang period is noteworthy simply because Haydn wrote a bunch of symphonies in minor keys. I mean, he did that, and they're exceptional works, and there's no question about that. But there are two things I want to keep in mind. First, Haydn's evolutionary trajectory was so steady and so clear from the very, very beginning. It's even though these symphonies are not always in chronological order, and there are some questions about dating, you know, some of them. I mean, it's just, it's just a steady evolutionary progress. Now, not all composers are evolutionary composers. They don't all start at point A and wind up at point Z at the end of their careers. But Haydn was the most evolutionary composer that ever lived. I mean, for example, Bach is not an evolutionary composer. He's a very, very great composer. But you don't see this progression from one style to a completely different style at the end of his life. Rather, Bach was a sort of summarizer and compendious, compendious all-around musician in the style in which he worked. And, you know, that's a whole different brand. It's like chocolate and vanilla. Whereas Haydn was really, really constantly evolving and making progress. And the the path of that progress is always towards simultaneously greater expressive intensity combined with greater formal ingenuity and a constant ability to experiment and expand the resources of music as he knew them. And so when you hear that that little first subject, that first subject is a weird, eccentric first subject. It's as Sturm und Drangish as any of his more, you know, minor or sort of famous examples, such as the opening of like the Farewell Symphony, which is only a few symphonies away, by the way, although it may be a little further in years than in the numerical, you know, list of the symphonies, the chrono- which is not quite chronological, as I've said. So, you know, it's worth keeping in mind as we discuss these these Sturm und Drang symphonies, that they will definitely be more intense, more colorful, more exceptionally interesting than anything Haydn did before, but they will also be formally more interesting and also clearer in some ways. See, one of the ironies and the other point I want to make about the Sturm und Drang period is that in literature, um, as exemplified by, for example, Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther, or one of those things, is that is that it was an it was a romantic movement, an anti-rational movement. But in music, it's just the opposite. At least in Haydn's music, in Haydn's music, writing something which is unbelievably quirky, or somehow somehow you know obviously expressively intense in one way or another, is going to mean that it stands out even more. Which means that structurally. As, it, as it's used within a larger formal framework, it's going to make that framework even more clear and in a way more sectional. 
And so Haydn's challenge was not, you know, how to do bizarre things in the course of a symphony. Anybody can do that. And he did that. It's how to integrate those things into a coherent, overall, organic, larger structure. And that was Haydn's achievement during the Sturm und Drang period. How to be incredibly expressive, but also incredibly formally concise and coherent. I mean, that's what Haydn was up against, and that's what he achieved. And he does it in this very symphony. And one way you can tell is by listening simply to this, to this really quirky little, little first subject. Now that first subject, as you're going to hear, is in a simple 3-4 time. It's in waltz tempo. It's what? Do, 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 So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. A perfect little four bar phrase. And then there's another one, another perfect little four bar phrase. And then it really starts to get swing it. It's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, drum, bum, ba dum, ba dum. But then what happens? Whop! Whop! like this and then and then everything changes because if you actually count the bars remember we talked about phrase lengths and unusual phrase lengths we, we discussed the fact that in music most normal phrasing comes in four and eight bar segments and it's regular you might have a tune that has a first half that's eight bars and a second half that's eight bars and that balances it gives everything a feeling of symmetry well, as you could tell from that first subject, there's no symmetry there. And in fact, that, that first subject is not a multiple of four or eight. It's an 18-bar phrase where you can hear the initial four-bar phrases answered by something that's 10 bars. And those 10 bars are divided up. Well, you can divide them up all kinds of ways. You could divide them into six and four. You can listen to the whoop. And here, let me play it for you again. You'll see what I mean. Listen to this. That second half of the tune where it has the pauses and the and the little pokey and the laughing, screaming little thing there, well, I mean, that could be its own little little phraselet. So you could do that ten bars as 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 four plus one plus five. Maybe that's a better way to do it. However you do it, if you just try and count one, two, three, one, two, three from the start of the symphony, you're going to run into a real problem when you get into that second half. And so Haydn has to figure out part of the, the work of this symphony is, is creating a movement which can accept very strange material such as this. And, you know, Haydn was always working on strange materials. We heard it in some of his earlier symphonies, too. But he's going to be working with them from now on more frequently. And he's going to be finding some fascinating ways to deal with them. And the music, as a result of that, is going to become more expressively intense and vivid. And that's what the Sturm und Drang period is all about. So, I'm going to play you the entire first movement without, without repeats. And you'll get to hear this wonderful, wonderful first subject. And because it's so peculiar, Haydn winds up having to start all over again and repeat it partially. But remember when I said that sonata form music really comes in two kinds. There's the subjects, the themes that occupy certain key areas. And then there's motion music, music that gets us from one place to another. And boy, is this a perfect example of that, because the motion music that comes after that weird little tune is so motive. I mean, that's what happens. Because this thing is so quirky, the, the music has to get even more vigorous. It has to move even more clearly to something else. And that something else has to be very, very highly contrasted with what we just heard. It's going to be far more symmetrical and normal than the other thing. So the contrasts are heightened and the, the, the objective of each kind of music is going to be more, more vividly etched in our minds. 
So when I when you listen to this, I want you to pay attention. I know we're playing music, so you want to like turn around away and do other things, and there's just like a picture of something sitting there while it's playing. But pay attention because I'm going to tell you where the first subject is, where the motion music is, and where the second subject is. And I really want you to focus on the contrast between them, just how unbelievably clearly Haydn delineates the different functions of the different characters in this particular movement, which gives them their extremely, extremely, I keep saying the word vivid, but it, it is, it's, it's characters, it's characterful. And that's what the music has. So let me play you the first movement. This is the Naxos recording conducted by um, Helmut Muller Bruhl with the Cologne Chamber Orchestra. It's a very, very fine performance. And you'll notice the symphony has trumpets and horns and timpani, and it's in C major. And C major, as we've already discovered with Haydn, with its high horns, is a very exciting key. It can be a formal key, something that marks festivity. And this is a very festive work. There's very little troubling about it. But on the other hand, on the other hand, its high spirits are more than formal. It's not courtly music at all. It's funny music. That first subject particularly is, is a joke. It's a joke. It doesn't know where it's going. All of a sudden it jumps up and screams and gets tickled and <laughs> does things as a result of that. So let's listen to the first movement and watch where I mark the various sections, just so you're perfectly clear on what's going on and where it's going on. Here we go.
So I think this movement illustrates very, very clearly how in the Sturm und Drang period, not only do you get heightened expression, but you get heightened formal clarity or formal ingenuity. I mean, it doesn't mean the form is going to be symmetrical or exactly what like a typical sonata movement is supposed to do. But whatever Haydn does, it's going to be extremely, extremely firmly delineated, like with a highlighter. That's what happens with these things. And this is also true of the second movement. Now, in these slow movements, one of the things that has happened up to this point, roughly, and we're talking now the late 1760s, um, basically, roughly, somewhere in there, from the mid to the late 1760s, early 1770s, that's when this Sturm und Drang style, in Haydn anyway, begins to, begins to become manifest. Most of these slow movements are for muted strings with no woodwinds whatsoever just strings. And in this particular movement, Haydn says hello to his wind section. He used woodwinds in slow movements before in the what we call church sonata symphonies. The symphonies that begin with a full-scale slow movement in adagio. In those cases, because it's the first movement of the whole symphony, and it's extremely important in first position, Haydn will use his full orchestra including winds. But for an interior slow movement to use woodwinds is extremely rare. But from here on, they're going to start popping up with great regularity. And Haydn is going to use them with incredible skill and sophistication. And this movement is one of the great examples. And for that reason, I, again, I have to play you the whole movement. I'll play it without repeats, but it's about, it's a good chunk, four minutes or so of music. Because not only does Haydn bring in the wind section, the woodwind section, that is two oboes, two horns, and a bassoon on the bottom, but he adds to it. This movement has a solo flute. And boy, does that, you'd think one flute, <laughs> who cares, right? It's just a flute. What a difference that flute makes. It, it colors the entire second subject, because this is a sonata movement, of, of, the, of, the, of the movement. I mean, and it is gorgeous. It's magical, in fact. And that, too, is part of the Sturm und Drang aesthetic. It has a, a dreamy, almost impressionistic quality with very, very arresting harmony. It's not, it's not tragic. It's not minor key miserable. It's just other. And it's that otherness, that sense of music exploring, you know, strange new worlds to seek out new life and new civilizations to boldly go where music has never gone before. That's what this this movement does. And so you just, just sit back and listen to it and listen for the flute. Listen to how Haydn uses the flute, not as a melody instrument particularly, but as, at least initially, as simply an aspect of texture to create just, just an unbelievably rich and mysterious and haunting new color that had never been heard in music up to that time. Here is the slow movement. Oh, I just love this piece. It starts out with just those muted strings and you have no idea what's about to happen. And then, and then poof, the magic happens. Here it is.
Isn't that just an amazing thing? I mean, it really is. I just think it's an extraordinary movement. It really is. Now, the minuet comes third, and it's for the full orchestra with the trumpets and the, you know, the drums and everything happening. And it, this, it finally, because of all of the unusualness that's been going on, I mean, we need a little contrasting relief and regularity. And this minuet is a very regular minuet for Haydn. It really is. It does not. In, in, it does not indulge in a lot of the sort of rhythmic tricks and craziness that we hear in some of Haydn's dance pieces. It's pretty straightforward. It's very stately. It's majestic. It's what the C major symphony, this kind of um, heroic and and courtly music, is supposed to sound like. You might say, and because it's so formally regular, and and I think I use the I just use the word courtly, aristocratic maybe. Um, it, it just highlights all of the all of the peculiarities that have been going on all around it. But I'm going to play you from the trio section, the middle section, and then the complete minuet, because that way you'll get to hear the whole thing. And you'll see what I mean by its tendency to regularity. But the trio is quite marvelous. It's for high horns and oboes primarily. And boy, do they sound brilliant. I mean, it's just that incredibly virtuosic writing that Haydn loves to indulge in in C major because he had those high horns in that key and they're very very exciting and all by themselves they create an extraordinary musical tension just just by virtue of the the intensity of those laser-like high notes so here's the middle section running back into the repeat of the minuet <laughs> we come at last to the finale. Oh my goodness, what an amazing finale this is. Truly, it's, it's one of my favorite Haydn finales in any of the first oh, 40 or 50 symphonies or so. I love it. I love it because it's music that's made of nothing. And Haydn is nowhere more fabulous than when he's making something out of nothing. You may have noticed at the end of the exposition in the first movement, and I marked it, by the way, so if you were looking, you noticed it, that there is a cadence theme, that the, exposi the exposition comes to a close with a brilliant high trumpet motive on one note with repeated notes. It's just dum ba da ba 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 bum ba da ba 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 bum ba da da ba like that. It's, it's very exciting. It's kind of hard to miss. And, you know, because those, those high brass 
brass parts are so much a part of this style when Haydn's in C major. Well, this finale takes that idea of just repeated notes in the brass and makes it the entire substance of the movement, basically. The theme, such as it is, is just ba-da-da-dum, 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 ba-da-da-dum. That's it. It's a one-note theme in a repeated rhythmic pattern. So the idea, the main idea of the movement isn't a tune at all, it's a rhythm. And the entire movement is a perpetual motion movement. It's in six, eight times, so it's going cha 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 like this. And over this constant constant rhythm, this straight of steady, steady eighth notes, what Haydn does is he just superimposes various rhythmic patterns, which sometimes become a little bit melodic, but not very much. There is a second subject, it's nothing but descending scales. You know, it's just some descending scales. That's all it is. There's very, very little melodic substance in this music. But there is an endless quantity of rhythmic and timbral and and other kinds of musical qualities. And that's something else that you always have to pay attention to when you listen to these Haydn symphonies. Because a subject, as I've said a million times, isn't necessarily a tune. It could be anything. It could be any musical quality from which Haydn can create something distinctive. And he was one of the very, very few composers who had this, this broader conception of what music could be, what the language of music could be. You know, I mean, you know, some composers, Mozart, for example, is a completely different composer in a very different style. Mozart was a melodist. He wrote tunes. Haydn could be a melodist, but he wasn't always. His range of reference was extraordinarily wide. And in this quirky little finale, you're going to hear Haydn making an entire movement out of virtually nothing as far as traditional traditional musical ideas are concerned. I just love this movement. I think it is so much fun to listen to, precisely because it's so different, because it's it's so clear that Haydn's saying, hey, watch this. This is going to be really, really cool. You're going to get a whole movement, and it's only going to be based on one little three-note, repeated note thingy on the brass. And here it is. just exceptional. I mean, really, come on. You ever heard anything like that before in any period? It's so nifty. But there's an additional little, little 
little detail I thought I, I think I should mention before we sign off. And that's that the first subject, you notice it began with the strings. Like that. Well, if the first subject of the first movement was asymmetrical and be and 18 bars in length, this is even more so because it's 15 bars in length. But the asymmetry is is front loaded. In the first subject, it was the eight normal bars that sort of got you into the rhythm, and then it got really quirky because it was it was 10 bars after that divided strangely. Well, here Haydn is doing just the opposite. He's restoring order in a sense. The opening phrase, the, before the trumpets come in with ba da da dum ba da da dum that thing, the opening phrase is seven bars, just a complete seven bar phrase. It seems too short, which means that when the trumpets come in, they, they tend to interrupt it. That's what makes it so exciting. That's what gives the music some of its sense of urgency. So the trumpets come in, but they are perfectly grouped in four bar phrases. They are establishing or reestablishing normal order. And that's part of the, you know, the classical aesthetic, that however wacky things get, at the end of the day, normal order will be reestablished. And Haydn is doing it in this finale as well. And that, my friends, is Symphony Number no. 41. Just one of the most remarkable, oh, why do I always say that? They're all remarkable. They're extraordinary pieces. And nowhere more so than when Haydn is in his Sturm und Drang mode, um, where you can just enjoy all of the musical elements with, with, with heightened awareness to their significance and their expressive point. And in this case, that point is to be joyous and funny and magical and mysterious. Such an incredible piece of music. So keep on listening, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.